Good morning, everybody. Welcome. Thank you for joining us here today. My name is Mark Snattersy. I work for, for Alberta Health Services. I'm the Executive Director for Addiction and Mental Health in the Edmonton Zone. And I'm going to start off this morning's gathering uh, by respectfully acknowledging that the land on which we gather today is the ancestral and traditional territories of the people of Treaty 6, the, Me the Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 4. This area is home to the Cree, the Anishinaabe, Blackfoot, Stony Nakoda, Dene, Inuit, and Métis peoples. The city of Edmonton itself is home to one of the largest populations of urban Indigenous peoples in Canada who bring rich heritage and cultural traditions from across this land. We all have a responsibility to one another and to this land. Our hope is that we will move forward together in the spirit of reconciliation, that changes will be made to identify and address the barriers and the stigmatization that Indigenous peoples face in achieving healthy outcomes and assessing appropriate and compassionate health care. I'd like to now invite our Premier, Daniel Smith, to say a few words. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for being here today. And I'm just delighted to be at the, this facility, which I know has been in the works for a number of years. But when uh, Dr. Cowell told me about the work that is being done by the Jasper Wellness Center, I was so interested in the work and the new space that I wanted to be here today to help launch this uh, initiative. And if I could just pause for a minute to say, I know people have wondered why we appointed an official administrator the reason we're here today is because of Dr. John Cowell. It was the very first call that he made when he became official administrator. He heard about the vision of the, or of the people who are behind this project, and he moved on it quickly to make sure that we could put the funding in place so that we could start receiving patients as soon as this week. This is the reason why we talked about how an official admin administrator could accelerate projects, and I'm hoping to be able to announce uh, many more on this. But this is the first of its kind in the entire country, and this is going to demonstrate how Alberta can lead the way on healthcare reform, and I hope that we can share the learning that we have here with other provinces. Albertans who are homeless often have complex mental health addiction and physical health challenges. Each of these can play a role in their journey towards physical healing. Many of us take for granted the ability to return from the hospital to a warm and safe home where we can recuperate. And for homeless Albertans, this is not an option. So their healing may be hampered by the harsh conditions that they live in. So I'm happy to see the centre partnering with Alberta Health Services to increase access to healthcare for Albertans who don't have a place to call home. And I'm pleased to announce that the Government of Alberta is able to help fund 36 transitional community beds to help with this important work. Providing people with housing after they are discharged from an emergency department means that they have one less thing to worry about while they're healing. This also means that beds in the emergency department open up for other patients. We know that there are significant demands on our emergency departments and this partnership will serve the dual benefits of improving health outcomes while also ensuring that wait times are improved. The housing offered through this program is more than just a safe and warm place. These new transitional community beds will have a positive impact on the health and wellness of some of the most vulnerable patients in the Edmonton area. It will help move individuals off the streets and into housing that's integrated with recovery-oriented supports. Albertans can stay here temporarily with the goal to ultimately transition into their own permanent housing. It's another example of our government's commitment to work with our partners across the province so Albertans have the care they need when and where they need it. I look forward to seeing the benefits of these beds to the Albertans who use them and to the entire healthcare system. And I'd like to recognize and thank the staff and volunteers at Jasper Wellness Centre for all that you do to take care of the city's most vulnerable. Now I'll hand it off to our, our Health Minister, Jason Copping, for some additional remarks. Thank you so much, Premier, and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, and thank you as well to the Jasper Place Wellness Center for inviting us here to this lovely space today. I'm, I'm glad to be with you this morning to the launch this very unique program. I always appreciate the opportunity to uh, share good news about the ongoing work to provide all Albertans, especially our most vulnerable, the best care where and uh, when they need it. 
And, and that includes when they leave our hospitals and our emergency departments. This program offers an alternative to discharging a patient experiencing homelessness so that they have a safe place to go to where they can access ongoing care and ongoing support. It means as soon as they're cleared to leave an emergency department, there is now an improved process for helping them with next steps. This transition is done by coordinating discharge plans between Alberta Health Services and the team with Jasper Place Wellness Centre. They work together to make sure individuals released from hospitals have a safe, supportive place to go when they finish their recovery in the emergency department. And while they are a part of this program, clients can receive full wraparound social services such as housing support, income support, and connections to employment opportunities. And that's why it's so important that these community beds are available for vulnerable Albertans. They are designed to provide timely access to a healing space where clients will have access to social supports, mental health services, and addictions treatment. Homelessness is an increasingly complex, difficult problem to address. And so we have to do our best to provide all available supports that we can, especially when people are in need of health care. So I want to thank Alberta Health Services and Jasper Place Wellness and all of their volunteers as well as all the municipal and local organizations for all their work. This is a remarkable project that quite frankly is much needed and it demonstrates the types of innovative thinking that is needed as we work through the challenges that exist in our healthcare system. Challenges that we are tackling head on with our healthcare action plan, which is identifying immediate actions to build a better healthcare system to provide world-class care when and where Albertans need it the most. So once again, I'd like to thank the Jasper Wellness Centre. I'd like to thank Alberta Health Services uh, for being innovative and working together to be able to provide the space and also to, you know, to be able to pr improve the flow through our, enti our entire healthcare system. Not only are we, are we providing better care uh, for those most vulnerable in society, uh, but we're also improving the flow to better access to our emergency department system. And with that, I'd like to call upon Moro Kiaz, our interim CEO at AHS, to say a few words. Moro. Thank you, Minister Copping. Thank you, Premier. Good morning, everyone. Very, very happy and excited to be here this morning. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure to be here today with all of you to celebrate this exciting and important collaboration that we've done with Jasper Pace Wellness Centre. According to Homeward Toy Trust, as of December 22nd, there are 2,769 people experiencing homelessness in Edmonton alone. We recognize that as a society, more can be done to support these vulnerable residents. Supporting our patients who are experiencing homelessness is about providing health care that is encompassing. This isn't about their immediate care needs in an emergency department. This is about ensuring that they have access to programs, supports and services when they are back out into the community. This work has been a pri uh, priority for Dr. John Cowell, our official administrator, as he was immediately interested in learning about how we could support this kind of a program. And together with the advocacy and support with Dr. Louis Francisketti, they played an important role in seeing this one come together today. People who are experiencing homelessness often have chronic health issues and the vulnerability of their situation makes them more susceptible to ongoing health issues. These transition beds will provide a safe place for clients to access community supports and services. We want to be there for these clients on a more consistent basis. It will allow for more stable care and ongoing follow-up, which ideally could prevent the need for future emergency visits and for additional ambulance assistance. AHS is committed to annual funding for 36 beds, 12 of which will open later this month, and it's our goal to safely get clients out of hospitals, out into recovering in the community. This is an investment in the ongoing health care of these clients. I'd like to thank Jasper Place Wellness Centre for their collaboration on the program. We're so pleased to be working with you now and in the future. I'd also like to acknowledge the Government of Alberta for their ongoing support and the hard work of so many partner agencies and organizations, some of which are how have representatives here today. We can accomplish so much more work when we work together, and I look forward to seeing the impact of this program. Thank you, and I'd now like to welcome Taylor Sikora to the Jasper Place, from Jasper Place Wellness Center to come and speak. Thank you. Thank you, Moro. Good morning, I'm Taylor with the Jasper Place Wellness Center. I'm the co-founder. 
The Jasper Place Wellness Centre builds strong community and people by addressing social and health-based inequities. We do this by providing informed, radically innovative, intentional health and community-based solutions that enable autonomy for those experiencing poverty. Bridge Healing is an accommodation program for houseless individuals being discharged from Edmonton's emergency departments. The program will support individuals in finding permanent housing that meets their needs, while also ensuring that they are connected to the right community and health-based resources to maintain that housing and build lives that they are proud of. While clients are staying with us, they will have access to support will help, that will help them to find permanent housing, such as identification, securing income, and healthcare needs, like referrals to clinical detox and residential treatment. The building itself has been intentionally designed to encourage community and connection while providing better outcomes for those who live here and stay with us. The construction of the space is being finished out through a partnership with Women Building Futures, which has created, which has created employment opportunities for underemployed women in our city. We've been working on this project for quite some time, and I want to thank the City of Edmonton for their early leadership early leadership and support of this community-led idea, and to Dr. Louis, Louis Francis Cuddy for championing the vision that leaders should constantly be looking to improve systems and outcomes for our most vulnerable. I want to thank Alberta Health Services, Premier Smith, and Dr. John Cowell. This innovative project will fill an immediate gap in the current continu continuum of care model and would not be happening without your leadership. Lastly, to the individuals with lived experience in being houseless who have worked diligently over the past three years to advise this work, we're thankful for your guidance and we are hopeful that you see your fingerprints on this project. Next to speak, we have Dr. Louis Francis Cuddy. Great, well, <clears throat> I'm not gonna repeat a lot of what's been said, but uh, I have to take this time to ask all of us to stop for a second and actually reflect what's going on here. Madam Premier, Mr. Minister, Morrow, what we're doing here is we're changing the practice of medicine. In the past, historically, for whatever reason, patients that have presented in their most vulnerable state received access to the top medical care they could probably receive, and then unfortunately, we had to turn them back into the street. So what we're doing here today is historic. It's never been done in Canada, and I think it'll set a new standard. AHS is a world leader as the largest integrated healthcare delivery model in Canada for AHS to step up and do this with the full support of our premier and our minister is, um, it's beyond my wildest expectations. Uh, everybody knows I've been a, a critic of when I see things not going well and I don't give praise too easily but I've got to really give a lot of praise for this one because it's actually upset the apple cart. We were planning on showing that this model could work and then through the inspirational leadership of Dr. Cal and Marshall Smith, the uh, Premier's Chief of Staff, providing advice, we end up here today. So I couldn't sleep last night because I, I still don't believe this is true. But um, to be honored with your presence and your commitment, I think is going to make the biggest change. So when I go to work today and I, I see one of my homeless patients, I can't wait to say, hang in there, buddy, one more week and I've got a place to send you. So, Madam Premier, I can't tell you how much this means to our patients, as Taylor said, and to Councillor Salvador for being one of the first people to step up and help us, and the University Hospital Foundation and the Royal Alex Foundation and all the volunteers that have worked on this for the last four years. I just want to thank everyone from the, from the bottom of my heart. All right, thanks everybody. That concludes our formal uh, presentation today. We're gonna head to Q&A. I will get to every question on the floor today, but we will start with on-topic questions. One question, one follow-up. Audrey, go ahead. Hi, this is... Do you mind? Oh. <clears throat> Doc, can I just get you to maybe comment on what impact you think it would have at the Royal Alex? I don't know if uh, people will understand the, the, the connection there about how it's going to improve the uh, emergency experience. If you wouldn't mind commenting on that. 
Well, we were very fortunate that uh, we were given some statistics on how many homeless patients actually visit our emergency departments. And the uh, grand total is the equivalent population of Jasper, Canmore, and Banff every year are seen in emergency with uh, presenting homeless. The Royal Alex takes the brunt of it, 8,800 visits a year uh, by patients experiencing homelessness. Some of them two or three times a day, taking an ambulance, coming in, and having to wait to be seen. So the immediate impact you'll see is a reduction in EMS calls and a reduction in ER visits and better outcomes for the patient and not only cost savings to the system, but for an individual. I have a mom who sends me an email once a week, are the beds open for my son? Are the beds open for my son? So for that mom, this is gonna make a real big difference. So honestly, I, you know I'm a big critique of government at times, but it's, it's hard to critique on this one because I think we all collectively have got it right on. Hi, it's uh, Audrey Nebrou from Radio Canada. Well, I think I'll start with that because Mr. Francesco, I think you speak French. Um, if I may ask you to say that in French, um, what's the impact that you'll see in emergency services? Les impacts que vous verrez de ce projet sur les services d'urgence uh, ici en Alberta? Les impacts, on va les voir de tout de suite. Une fois qu'on a des, les lits avaient pour les, les gens, on va voir qu'il va y avoir moins de demandes pour les ambulanciers, puis moins de demandes de leur département d'urgence, puis ça va, ça va occurrer tout de suite. Pas demain, mais aujourd'hui. Comme ça, c'est pour ça que je dis que c'est une histoire, une, un événement historique, parce que ça n'a jamais eu dans la province d'Alberta ou dans le pays aussi. Mm -hmm. And my second question can be answered by any of you. Um, we've mentioned there's over 2,000 homeless people currently in Alberta, and this is 36 beds. So how much of the demand do you think this will answer, and how many more beds do you think you would need ultimately to fulfill that mission? Oh, sure. Yeah, uh, well, you know, the uh, philosophy is that uh, when a patient comes into emergency having a heart attack, we don't turn them around and say, can you come back in a week or can you come back tomorrow? We take care of them immediately. We think that 108 beds would be a good dent, and especially if we can move the patients through every 30 days, 108 beds times 30 will tell you that we can start impacting thousands of individuals. But the most important thing is to get this open, show it works, proof of concept, and then scale up. And this can be scaled up throughout the entire province, and once it is, then we can repatriate patients from Edmonton to whatever community they come from. 108, that's right? Well, uh, well, one awaits a start. Okay. You know, that's good. <laughs> and that's just Edmonton. That's just right. Edmonton. All right. Thank, thank you. Hi, good morning. Morgan from Global Edmonton. I'm just wondering if, if this is the first of its kind in Canada, if there's already been any interest from other cities, other provinces, kind of wanting to know. I know it's very new, but wanting to know a little bit more about what we're doing here. A little bit more about the expansion plan, yeah. don't you? You, you may as well just stay there. Yeah. <laughs> no, the, uh, no one's done this before. The reason no one's done this before is because it's very difficult. It's easier for me to go to work and, you know, see my patients and go home and forget about this problem. But uh, that's why it's taken four years to get to this stage. This idea originated at the university with some graduate students. And then through the partnership of a lot of community members, we're at this stage. And that's why I keep emphasizing how crucial it is that these folks are here supporting it because all of a sudden this will make news and you can rest assured the phones are going to start ringing very soon when somebody figures out that Alberta has figured out a way to take care of patients that are homeless. The next question we're going to get is what about all the patients that are inside the hospital so admitted on the wards that don't have a place to go that's the next problem we got to solve and eventually Steve who works here has, has the vision of well, why can't somebody just come up and knock on the door and walk right up and say, can I get help? Bypassing EMS and ER at the same time. And that's the last question I answer. Okay. <laughs> Taylor, did you want to answer what the expansion plans are? <laughs> this is definitely a pilot project, so we want to prove out that the model works. Historically speaking, from a transitional housing perspective, we know it will work, but as an accommodation program with Alberta Health Services, let's prove it out and then grow. I see that this could go province-wide. We have um, issues with houselessness across the city, and we know that our social determinants of health impact our health. So I think if we can talk uh, 
have great outcomes from this pilot, which we will. We'll prove it out and see it expand. All right, and then this one's for the Premier. Um, we just got word the Independence Party of Alberta is calling on you to make good on the commitment to see the charges dropped on the pastor in question with the vaccine, public health restrictions and things like that. Um, are you still planning to make good on your commitment to drop those charges? The, the way our, our system of, uh, of justice works is that we do have an independent justice department and independent Crown prosecutors, and I have asked them to consider all charges under the lens of, is it in the public interest to pursue? And is there a reasonable likelihood of conviction? Um, as we continue to see some of these cases go through, some of them get dropped, some of them fail, they have to com consistently recalibrate. But uh, I do want to make sure that they have an independent process for assessing that. But I ask them on a regular basis, um, as new cases come out, is it in the public interest to pursue? And is there a reasonable likelihood of conviction? And so I'll, I'll leave the, the justice system to work, but I, I, do, I do think that's an important lens for us to be looking at these kinds of charges. Hi, Madeline Smith from the Edmonton Journal. Um, I don't know if maybe it's best for the Premier or the Health Minister to address this. Can you explain a bit more about um, Dr. John Cowell's involvement in, in this uh, project and how exactly he sort of sounds like he intervened to make this happen a bit more quickly. I'm just unclear on uh, sort of timelines and what the project was envisioned as before and how that became different after Dr. Cowell apparently got involved. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, originally, Dr. Franceschetti had approached us because as he'd indicated, this was an initial um, project that was you know, concepted four years ago at the university. And so when John had come forward, John had, uh, had met with Louis and the two of them had collaborated on considering you know, what options we can do, homelessness being top of mind at that point in time. John thought this had great and, and immediate impact on the measures that he was brought in to help us with, right? One being uh, our emergency department and our EMS. And as Louis had indicated earlier, these have two immediate impacts on that, where we can get people discharged and stop the, the repeat discharges, plus the need for EMS. This has a direct impact on our capacity and hospital flow. And so from there it evolved and John was behind it 100% saying, let's make this happen. Uh, the initial 36 beds will um, roll out over the next, we got you know, 12 coming next week, we've got a few coming up in the, in the next several months, and we're looking at a larger expansion here in Edmonton and then potentially province-wide. If, if I can just add, you know, one of the, this is, one, like, this is just an example of the, uh, uh, the key priorities that the, the Premier and I highlighted for, for Dr. Cowell to work with, with uh, Morrow and, and the executive lead team uh, to move faster. Uh, on dealing with challenges in our emergency department and to deal with flow. And as we indicated when we appointed Dr. Cowell, one of the key issues of that um, dealing with flow is alternate levels of care. So we get people out of hospitals faster because it, it's, it's a pipeline. You know, come in, you know, uh, uh, paramedics, you know, EMS into the emergency department, emergency department, inpatient, inpatient. Some people will go home. Some people don't have a home to go to, which is what this fills the need. And, and others maybe have to go to continuing, uh, continuing care spaces. So, you know, there are people in the hospital that could otherwise, they don't need to be there from an acute care reason, but they still need supports and services. So having alternate levels of care, this is one example. And, I, and uh, uh, you know, this is a focus for uh, Dr. Cowell to work with the team. So I'm very pleased that this is, uh, been able to put in, been put in place so quickly, and we need to do more of this, not only on the homeless side, but quite frankly, for other alternate uh, levels of care, so we can actually move people through this faster, through the system faster, and, and reduce our wait times in emergency departments. And how will you be measuring the impact of this facility? And um, you know, if you're looking at scaling up uh, in the future, uh, how will you be sort of looking at what impact it's having? So we'll probably look at it in, in two modes, I would say. One proof of concept that Taylor had indicated, six months we'll, we'll reevaluate and make sure that it's doing the impact that we had initially proposed. Dr. Cowell has been uh, particularly focused on key measures for the system that have immediate impact on things that we do, uh, uh, conversely, to affect those measures. So in this case, um, as I mentioned earlier, we've got EMS and the hospital flow piece in terms of discharge components. So those are two particular measures we'll keep an eye on. And then the proof of concept after six months to see effectiveness uh, for our clients.
Ultimately, seeing people find permanent housing that meets their needs that they can maintain is for us on the operational side a huge outcome. On top of that, I think um, connecting people to primary care that also meets their needs, that they can build a relationship with their primary care doctor and we can reroute some of that behavior instead of going to the emergency department, do we have a primary care doctor we can rely on? So for us as an operator of the program, of course, seeing people maintain or gain and then maintain that housing and then rerouting them through primary care and ensuring that their physical and mental health needs are being met by their primary care doctors. Perfect. It's Carly Robinson from City News. I wanted to ask about uh, frostbite amputations. They are at a 10-year high. How would this play into it? But also, if someone could comment on the situation as a whole, what's happening and what needs to be done to prevent these amputations from happening? Yeah, uh, I mean, those are devastating injuries. Uh, I just saw one the other day that um, I'm still reeling from. So uh, it's very complicated. For a lot of folks that end up with frostbite, um, there's more than just the frostbite. There's mental health issues and substance misuse issues and um, violence and a continuum of, of, uh, of issues. So the important thing is that when we're seeing those vulnerable patients in emergency, right now, unfortunately, some of them don't want to go to shelters. Some of them don't have the skills to know what to do. So we wouldn't have to worry because it's one cab ride away. And when they're received here, they have their own warm bed. The, the units upstairs are beautiful, self-contained. And they have a safe place to probably sleep for three days, wake up, and then find these warm, caring people that are going to say, the project's called the Simina Kochi in Cree, which means to try again. So how can we help you try get your life back on track again? These folks didn't ask to be homeless. This started probably 40 years ago when they were exposed to adverse childhood experiences. And the more adverse childhood experiences you're exposed to, the greater the likelihood you're going to end up in a situation that can lead to frostbite. So this program, you could call it a frostbite reduction program. You can call it just about anything. As a matter of fact, these folks might be charged for practicing medicine without a license because <laughs> this is actually practicing good medicine. So I hope that answers your question, that frostbite is not simply people being out in the cold. There's a reason they're out in the cold. And just on the, the business side, I was wondering if someone could talk to the costs of this, uh, this program, not just the provincial dollars, but the total costs, and if there's any estimations of what it could save the system. You'll have to introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Maurice Soroka. I'm the CEO of Jazz Place Wellness Centre. Uh, the cost of this building actually costs about as much as a house in Windermere, so it's very low cost around $100,000 a door to build this building. It can be built in three months with the right partners, which we do now have, the City of Edmonton, the Province of Alberta. So it's very uh, cost effective to build this building. Uh, operationally, very cost effective as well. Uh, right now we're funding uh, through the uh, Province of Alberta um, to uh, fund the building. So. Um, I, I think I'll stop there and just say that it'll be very cost effective. Can you provide uh, for the building? Yeah, Operation, $80 a day per person to operate the building. That's what it costs to operate the building. And to operate the building would be very cost effective. This building uh, is 140% of the uh, bid, building code on efficiency. It has the ability to be net zero. Um, uh, we use heat pumps to heat the building so it's, and chill the building, cool the building, uh, so it's very cost effective. And, and like I said, about $100,000 a door, and there's 12 doors here. And how does $80 a day, how does that compare to staying in a hospital bed? Oh. I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> or I should talk about that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's uh, apples and oranges comparison for sure. When you look at the, the, the program here, we're looking at about a million dollars investment to, to start from AHS, which we found internal dollars to be able to do this. Hospital bed per stay, depending on the criticality of the patient, can range from you know, a thousand to thousands of dollars. When we're looking at $80 per day, no comparison between the two. Can I just run the cash Please. register? Please. So let me let, <laughs> let, let me run the cash register. Hi, nine one one. Okay, let me send an ambulance. Eight hundred and fifty dollars, roughly, right there. Go to emergency. Make a chart. That's about a thousand dollars with the visit and everything. Oh, you've got frostbite. Now you have to go to the operating room. 
oh, not only have you got frostbite, but now you've got septicemia. You're septic. You have to go to our intensive care unit. And that's where, as Morrow said, those are in the tens of thousands a day. And then you have to be discharged. Well, we don't have any place to send you. So what do we do? We discharge you to homelessness again. Mm -hmm. That system is really broken. What today says is those days are over. We're not going to put up with that. And literally, you're going to have hundreds of millions of dollars of savings because if you have 8,850 patients just at the Royal Alex and over 25,000 a year coming throughout our system, and a lot of these are unfortunately patients that come through the system over and over again. So there's our rough estimate is that this is going to save the system and society an enormous amount of money. But not only given that, just think of the impact on the individual themselves, right? You can't put a dollar figure on having your own place and getting your life back on track. Mm -hmm. if I, can I just ask a clarification question? You mentioned about a 30-day stay for the people who will be here. Um, why that length of time? And if someone needs more time, can they stay longer? Yes, again, I want to reiterate that this is a pilot project, so we will have learnings from this. So that's a time frame that historically for us, we think people will be able to work through. If it does take longer than 30 days, because perhaps they don't have identification and we have to wait a two week period to get identification or we're working on securing income, we'll work with the individual on that. Um, the goal is that this is a program. People are completing steps to acquire the housing that they need. That's gonna look different for every individual depending on their needs and their situation. So that's a rough timeline. We're committed to ensuring people are moving through the program and that's why we have that tight timeline. But again, we're doing Doing research with this project has never been done before. So we have to set some standards and then learn from those and adjust as we go. Thank you. Can All right. Just, I'll, ju I'll just connect this with an announcement we're making later today in Red Deer. So we're op opening our first recovery community today as well, or in the next couple of days. And if you followed what we've been doing with the recovery oriented system of care, it is about providing wraparound services in a facility very much like this, and that will be extended stay. So we want to build these out in every community. I believe we've got plans for eight. So the first one is opening today, and if um, you are able to send cameras down there so that you can connect the two, you'll be able to see how we're approaching this. This will be for that immediate urgent need on discharging patients, and the recovery communities will be as long as the patient needs. We're, we're not talking about 30 days there. It might be several months. It, it might be up to a year. But we want to give each individual who's struggling with mental health and addiction the opportunity to take as much time as they need to be able to, to get back their autonomy and get back independence. So the, these two projects being announced today are really just the first steps. There'll be more that we have to do in the Edmonton area to connect the great work that's happening here to ensure that it's seamless. And I know that they have a plan for helping to, to open up that recovery aspect later down the road, but, but we're, we're, we're moving ahead in other communities on that recovery focus. For those who, um, who, are, who are dealing with the addiction issue may not uh, be a direct connection from the hospital system, although that's certainly possible too, but those who want to, to seek help in getting off their addiction, we're, we're going to be starting that project later today. So that's the, the second part of this as well. All right, we have time for two more questions and we're gonna hit the phone lines to take those. Operator, first caller, please. Dave Kaiser, CTV. Good morning, my question for the minister. Uh, minister Copping, AHS has confirmed to me that you received an emergency health services plan after your predecessor, Tyler Shanver, requested one from AHS and they say they still haven't received any feedback, approval, or direction from your ministry. So I'm wondering if you've actually read that document and why it's taking so long to respond to it. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure exactly what document you're talking about. Um, we, we have received, like, AHS, I, I, think, I think what you're talking about might be is, you know, AHS did provide to us a, uh, a, a three-year plan. Um, uh, we, re, you know, we were reviewing that three-year plan. Um, at that point in time, we actually appointed uh, uh, Dr. Cowell before the, the review was, uh, was complete. Um, uh, Dr. Cowell is continuing to work with uh, the senior leadership team 
um, uh, Mauro Kies and, and, and the rest of the team to be able to uh, sort of refine that plan because certain elements of it, like even though it had pieces like you we know, were dealing with EMS and, and uh, uh, the objectives of, of EMS and uh, uh, also it in included, you know, uh, uh, staffing uh, challenge. You know, how do we deal with staffing challenges? Continuing care. So there's a, there are a number of aspects of it. Um, you know, Dr. Cowell wanted to work with the team to focus on the mandate that we gave Dr. Cowell, uh, with particular focus on on emergency departments. So that uh, that um, uh, work is underway, and we're actually going to be completing it over, over the next weeks. I think I think that's what you're talking about. I don't know. Uh, Moral, if you want to comment further on that. Yeah, I'll add to that. I think if, if the question relates to that particular document. So the three-year plan that uh, Minister Copping references was actually completed a while ago. Mr. Minister Copping myself worked closely on that document with, uh, with our, our executive team. When John arrived, um, the focus on initiatives like this where there are more uh, what I would say micro focuses in the document. He wanted some revisions in that. So it's a three-year rolling plan. We're going to incorporate his uh, his hospital flow, his patient flow components into that document. So it is basically indeed finalized. We're just incorporating the last steps and measures that uh, that actually coincided with the question that was uh, presented earlier in terms of how we're going to determine out, uh, outcomes to this. And so for our total health, uh, our health and business plan, uh, we're just incorporating a few additional measures that John wanted to do that we're going to determine the best uh, impacts to health system and, and performance. Safe, do you have a follow-up? I do, yeah. So um, what I'm being told by AHS is they actually haven't received any feedback or direction from the health ministry on this, and it's been waiting approval. What I'm confused about, if you're saying John Cowell had a, a hand in this document, is this was requested... Uh, before Minister Copping was appointed to that ministry, he was requested when uh, Tyler Chandra was still health minister and Verna Yu was still a part of the AHS. So I'm unsure of how John Cowell participated in this, because that would have been about six or seven months after this document was requested. I'm not sure what your source would be within our organization that would determine that. Um, as the interim CEO right now, there are no outstanding um, approvals we're waiting from the ministry by any means. We've been working uh, hand in glove on that. The three-year plan is, is a rolling plan. Uh, the concept would have been developed you know, early in uh, the 2022 year, but we work jointly with the Ministry of Health and Minister Copping on that document. Um, finalization on that was basically in its final stages and uh, John had come in taken a look at it and said you know I'd like to make a few tweaks to it but the initiatives that that are in that three-year plan as Minister Copping had indicated they're already well underway we're not waiting for approvals uh, the 10-point initiatives that we have in the health plan that has been mandated to Alberta Health Services has been underway for a long time already so I, I'm not quite sure what your source would be on that in terms of what we're waiting for is outstanding because there's none to my knowledge all right, operator, can you please put through our last caller? Catherine Gergowski, Alberta Today. Oh, hi. Um, I'm, for Dr. Francis Scuddy, um, you did touch on it a bit, but I'm hoping you can kind of paint the picture of what sort of complications or, or other problems lead people to come back to the ER after being discharged that otherwise wouldn't happen had they had a bed of their own to rest and recover in. Yeah, that's a good question. So um, I think the majority of the times it's ongoing issues, whether it's mental health issues, whether it's chronic medical issues, uh, COPD that's not been well cared for, uh, congestive heart failure, diabetes, asthma, uh, a lot of skin conditions. Uh, for a lot of folks that have had previous frostbite you know, with amputations, mobility issues, so it's, it's a full range of spectrum. And, and sometimes, to tell you the honest truth, I think they just want to have a place where they can talk to someone and sit down and stay warm, and we give them some of our you know, toast and soup, and that seems to be enough for some of them. So companionship's really important, and that's why this building is an informed design built on the Eden principle. There's only 12 beds. You put 12 adults together, and they form an instant community. So to you, it looks like a building, but when the folks tell you why the building looks like this, you'll see there's three separate buildings. They didn't build one big building, so it's to try and create a community. So patients come back to emergency for a variety of reasons, and I think one of the biggest ones is they just want to be 
feeling like they're part of something. And this will make people feel like they're part of something. It's like a family. It's like an Italian family. I'm trying to see if I can get some Italian grandmas to come. And, and in this community kitchen, this community kitchen that was funded by the Lions Club, wouldn't it be great to have nonas back there, you know, building up some soups and spaghettis and pastas and people coming down? And this is the environment. That's why there's no beds here. Any, anybody that would build this commercially would say, why are you wasting all that space? Get some sweets in it. These guys are smart. They built this building to meet the needs of the individual with the least amount of staff. And that's why it's a cost-efficient model. Catherine, do you have a follow-up? Yeah, that, that segues nicely into my follow-up. I'm, I'm trying to understand operationally what changes, because, of course, the center already has, you know, doctors. It has various programming. Um, will there be additional staff? What kind of support? You, you had mentioned that people will be there to help find employment and uh, get addiction treatment, but what kind of changes with, with the operations and staffing with it, these beds? Well, the staffing on site is really focused on, again, moving people through the steps needed to access housing. So we have trained housing workers and case workers who know how to secure housing for individuals who have experienced houselessness. We do have primary care doctors, local pharmacies connected to the project, and other long-standing programs in the community that can be brought in. Um, but ideally on site, the caseworkers and the housing workers are helping the individuals staying here access the resources they need to move through to housing. A lot of that looks like securing an income, finding identification, getting insurance, going to viewings, all of the steps any normal Albertan takes, but usually has a support network built into their life already to access and move through those steps. We are building those steps in through this process and through this program. So that's more of what's happening on site. I hope I answered that question correctly. All right, thanks everybody.